Hello, hello everyone. My name is Vasilis Ioannidis. I'm a Microsoft Technical Trainer here at Microsoft. I welcome you to my session today, Azure SQL Security Recommended Practices. Here's my email and my Twitter account. Uh, drop me any email if you need some assistance. Maybe I can be of, uh, of help. Uh, and of course, Twitter, where I mostly tweet about Azure SQL and security stuff. Now, let's move along and see what we have to cover today. So we're going to talk about, we're going to touch a bit on uh, Microsoft Threat Intelligence, the Zero Trust principles, and then the defense in depth, and why do we care about that. Then we're going to uh, cover some things for, uh, let's say, laying the grounds for a primer on the things that you need to know in order to, let's say, apply the best practices uh, with confidence. And then we're going to talk about the Azure SQL uh, security capabilities. And then we're going to discuss about the Azure security, uh, SQL security recommended practices. So what you're here for. Uh, we're going to close with some demos. Hopefully there will be time for that. Uh, if not, there will be videos with the demos, so don't worry about it. We're going to close with a summary as ever, as every time in order to reinforce what we've learned. So starting with some uh, statistics and some uh, threat stats and transaction stats. In general, uh, we have more than 1.2 billion devices connected to our Microsoft services, right? From uh, PC servers to uh, handheld iOS, Mac OS, um, Android devices, Linux, whatever you may have into your infrastructure, right? We're getting trillions of signals every day that we parse and we make predictions based on that with our machine learning algorithms and AI systems in place. All these telemetry, all these patterns that we identify as malicious or as non-malicious, we can leverage them afterwards as customers. You can leverage them as customers afterwards into your product design. Okay, so Microsoft Threat Intelligence, and this is a, um, a slide from the deck of Microsoft um, uh, cybersecurity reference architecture created and led and is uh, led by a um, prestigious colleague and cybersecurity architect here in Microsoft, uh, Mark Simos. I urge you to check the uh, short URL there to gather more information about that. From the same deck, also, we have the Microsoft Zero Trust principles. So this is all about, instead of assuming that everything behind the firewall is safe, the zero trust model, um, let's say, assumes um, the logic of assume breach and verifies its request as though it originates from an open network. So regardless whether the request originates from, uh, let's say, um, a safe source or what type of source it accesses, zero trust teaches us to never trust and always verify. So um, three basic principles to govern all your design. First of all, verify explicitly. Okay, so verify explicitly means always authenticate and authorize based on all available data points, including user identity, location, device health, the service or the workload that you are trying to uh, reach to, data classification and sensitivities, and also any kind of anomalies at the sign in process. Second, limit with use. Uh, List privilege access. So, useless privilege access is all about limiting the user access with just in time access and just enough access on the resource. Uh, make use of risk based adaptive policies. So, understanding if there is a sign in risk at the moment that the user is getting access to the resources, as well as, uh, let's say, uh, data protection in order to help secure both data as well as the productivity of the user. The third one, the third principle is assume breach. So we try to minimize the blast radius in case something goes wrong by segmenting access, right? So we verify end-to-end -end encryption and we use analytics to get visibility and, uh, and drive, let's say, threat detection and improve defenses as well as our overall security posture. Now we're going to see how we can achieve all these as we go through the capabilities of Azure SQL, as well as the next uh, thing that we're going to discuss, defense in depth uh, as a security model. So the first outer layer, let's say, is physical security. Okay. In each of these layers that you see here is that we're trying to apply different kinds of security controls in order to determine if the one who is trying to get access should have access, right? So we don't just apply on the physical security by, let's say, um, 
uh, guarding, safeguarding our data centers and our premises and our the data center floors and everything with guards, security rails and everything. But we're trying to do that at every level. So starting from physical security all the way to the data, right? And we have policies and access, which for now, identity and identity access management is our new perimeter, right? It's no longer the network that we were saying. So identity is our new perimeter. And then we have the perimeter itself. Now, we have Azure um, safeguarding our perimeter with basic DDoS protection. But if you need more, um, let's say, more elaborate uh, DDoS protection for your workloads, for your applications, you can enable what we call the standard uh, DDoS protection that guards against volumetric types of attacks or uh, even more elaborate DDoS attacks. Once you pass through the perimeter, then we have the networking. Networking is all about your virtual network and its related, let's say, features, right? And all these controls that you can apply. So talking about uh, things like uh, segregating our vignettes with subnets, creating a hundred spoke architecture to um, divide our workloads in different virtual networks and inside there are different kinds of subnets that we can apply network security groups in order to filter the traffic, right? And of course, um, connecting as as we, uh, let's say, based on need, based on the request, and based on justification, right? Um, then we have the VM compute layer, where the VM compute layer is about your um, virtual machines, right? And whatever kind of compute that you are hosting. Now, the virtual machines, um, we have specific features for virtual machines like Microsoft Defender for Cloud for servers where we get uh, things like continuous evaluation and vulnerability assessments for our VMs. We have um, things like Microsoft 365 Defender safeguarding our, um, not even, not only our Azure, um, let's say workloads, but also our on-premises workloads or even third-party uh, cloud provider workloads. After our VM compute, we have our applications, so we need to apply controllers on our applications. Our applications could be running on VMs, right, as infrastructure, as a service uh, logic. So I could have my IIS running on VM, but it could be also most, most of the times we're trying to push to platform as a service uh, models. So it could be, for example, an, uh, an app service, right? So I can enable uh, certificates and I can enforce the client also to have certificates if the need be. And then at the heart of all is the data. So we are through all these layers. So this type of onion logic, right? We have all these layers in order to make for any attacker difficult to penetrate at the end game, where it is the data, right? Our data, our customers, maybe data. So in that scenario, this is where we're discussing about SQL, right? So we have our customer data in the center, and then we have different kinds of, uh, let's say, controls on our SQL in order to make uh, better use of network security, access management, and threat protection, or even information protection when we're talking about data classification, audit, and all this kind of stuff. All this in order to make sure that our customer data is safe, right, and safeguarded from any kind of attack. So SQL Server Feature Capabilities provides, let's say, this method and um, this is a state of security at the data level, and it's how you achieve the defense in depth, okay? So at the infrastructure level, also for cloud-based or even hybrid solutions. So in addition with, uh, let's say, the Azure security measure, it is also possible to encrypt sensitive data, protect VMs um, with, uh, um, let's say, from viruses and malware, and secure network traffic, identify and detect threats that meet uh, compliance requirements or some kind of pattern that is mimicking uh, type of attacks that are related to SQL, right? So through uh, um, the platform of Microsoft Defender for Cloud, central management point for everything, not only Azure again, hybrid, multi-cloud, um, multi, multi so one point to rule them all and just have one view of our security posture end-to-end -end in our um, enterprise uh, state. Um, okay, so laying the ground, right? So um, first of all, we have Azure networking, okay? And Azure networking is about VNets and subnets. So 
whenever we want to deploy something like a VM, a SQL VM or an application, a VM computer or something, we need a virtual network. So in that virtual network, we have our address space, our IP address space, and then we go in and create subnets in order to, uh, if you remember, um, isolate different kinds of uh, workloads in different kinds of uh, subnets with its own IP range, with different kinds of network security groups. So we can also uh, filter the traffic in and out from that. So we can identify, for example, that um, our backend tier is only accessible from the middle tier or only accessible from this subnet, right? And our front end tier is not, uh, cannot access the backend tier directly. So we can do this kind of stuff. Um, VNet peering is all about um, connecting different virtual networks, right? Either regional or global in order to uh, maybe um, do any kind of communication between spokes or in case of a hub and spoke architecture, as we were trying to go in order to leverage shared infrastructure components like firewall, like DNS or Bastion or um, virtual network gateways for VPNs. So we put them all in a hub uh, VNet and then we, uh, we, con we connect the spokes VNets with uh, VNet peering, right? Uh, things that you also need to know is, um, or at least heard of, is side-to-side -side VPN or express route, different kinds of connectivity. Uh, one is over network, over public web, um, and is over um, IPsec tunnel, so end-to-end -end security. The other one is a private connectivity model. Um, it's about physical connection between your on-premises um, and express route provider and back to back with the Microsoft services. Uh, it's about low latency, high bandwidth uh, connection, uh, again, private, not over uh, traversing the public internet. So depending what kind of regulations you want to apply, what kind of compliance um, you need to adhere to, there are different kinds of connectivity things. Uh, again, on the connectivity, as we are in the networking stack, we have service endpoints and private links. And service endpoints work with uh, what we call subnet delegation. And this means that we have our VNets, remember, and inside there we have subnets. And maybe we want to, uh, let's say, connect our VM, whereas our middle tier may be running some specialized APIs or some kind of application that we have and we want to talk with our um, Azure SQL DB, right? Platform as a service offering. And we want to make this uh, in a way not going over the public internet or accessing it through the public IP, but traversing some more private uh, connectivity. So for service endpoints, what you do, you enable it on the service, on the subnet level, right? And whatever resources you have on the subnet, they can connect depending what kind of service you enable on the on the service endpoint. In our case, Azure SQL, we can traverse the Azure backbone instead of the internet in order to get to the Azure SQL DB um, that we have deployed. So this means, um, let's say, not public connectivity. We're still using the public IP of our uh, of the Azure SQL DB, but we are traversing through the Azure backbone and not the public internet. So we're not using a public IP of our VNet to go there. Um, in case we don't want to do that, and we want to have completely privacy over our connection, so we want everything to happen inside our virtual network, even when we're talking to an Azure SQL DB, then we can use uh, private links and private endpoints. And this is like where um, private links is a, is a service. It's a paid service while server and service endpoints are uh, free of charge, right? And private links are, you. it's like getting an IP from your subnet, right? So it's, uh, it's reserving an IP from your subnet, from your range. And the SQL DB is like coming into your, so it's like you're dragging in the SQL DB inside your virtual network. And then everything happens inside your VNet. So there's no traffic flowing outside of your virtual network, right? So this is the best practice in terms of connecting to other SQL DB, bring it in with a private link, enable also DNS um, on, on that one in order to be able to be accessible uh, also from different kinds of networks um, by integrating DNS to your private link. The last thing is Bastion, and Bastion is all about service management. So when you want to do a management on your VM, instead of opening uh, up to uh, a public IP, which is a very, very bad idea, just 
pushing out a public IP and opening either SSH or um, 3389 RTP, uh, RTP connectivity. You enable Bastion, which is like um, a managed service from Azure. It's being injected inside your VNet. It needs a specialized subnet uh, called Bastion subnet, and then it goes and deploys the Bastion uh, resources. And then you can uh, connect to your uh, machines privately, so no public IP for your VMs in order to connect. You just connect to the Bastion over TLS or 443. You don't even open need to open uh, firewalls from within your on-premises environment to access it because it's only outbound 443, right? So uh, this is also trouble-free uh, connectivity. Um, so most of the times you will be doing this over the portal. You gain access to the portal, to the Azure portal, and then you go to connect on the VM and choose Bastion. And it will open up an Azure, um, another, let's say, Edge browser window or Chrome or whatever you may be using, Brave. Um, and it will just... Uh, be like having an RDP or an SSH connectivity window, right? Uh, there is another SKU, a standard one that you can use in, to connect to uh, a Bastion host without connecting through the portal, so directly from your um, desktop, again, over TLS. So it's something also that you can, you can choose, but it's different SKU. Now, on the second, uh, on the second lay, on the second, let's say, pillar of the things we need to know: identity and access uh, regarding around Azure AD, different kinds of user types, cloud native, synced, and guests. The cloud native are the ones you create on Azure AD. The synced ones is about uh, hybrid identity, right? Bringing our own Azure uh, Active Directory uh, identities from our on-prem environment. Uh, we sync them up to Azure AD in order for them uh, to be able to use what we call uh, single sign-on and in some cases similar single sign-on in order to uh, gain access to either Azure resources, Azure applications we deploy, uh, Microsoft 365 services or any other kind of uh, SaaS offering that we can uh, give access to. The guest ones are for B2B, so it's like we have some partners, we want to invite them into our environment in order for them to be able to, let's say, um, uh, leverage some cooperation and do some uh, sharing of information and work on some specific projects and some specific resources. Instead of having uh, the burden of creating their users in our uh, tenant, we just invite them from with their own user. It could be a Microsoft account, could be um, a Gmail account, could be, um, let's say, um, um, another Azure AD account, of course, right? Uh, and you can invite them, an Outlook account, whatever. You can invite them in into your tenant and then you can give them access. Uh, the good thing about giving access uh, is that you can apply also conditional access. So even if, um, this user is not our user. We don't manage the user. We don't know this life cycle in terms of password and all these kind of policies. Uh, as soon as this user gets into our tenant realm, right, and, and this user is trying to access some resources, we can apply conditional access. And we can say, OK, uh, you need to uh, prove that you are who you say you are. So we can th do things like MFA. We can apply things like identity protection uh, features, like checking uh, sign-in risk um, and uh, user uh, risk policies. Um, things like uh, if, the, if that user is connecting through uh, behind an anonymous IP, we can block access, right? So things of this nature. Conditional access is the preferred way of implementing MFA. Don't enable MFA by default to everything a user does. At some point, there will be user fatigue and the user probably at some point, if um, his or her password is breached, maybe it will approve an attacker, right? So just uh, uh, make sure that you uh, intend to apply MFA whenever there is a need and not everywhere, okay? So privilege identity management um, is, let's say, the, the proposed way of giving access, just enough tax access and just in, in just in time access to the person who needs to be productive as uh, at the time that he wants or she wants to elevate uh, himself or herself to another role, okay? So say, for example, you, there is um, a developer in your organization 
who needs to uh, do uh, an application registration on your Azure AD, right? Instead of um, giving permanent permissions as an application administrator on your Azure AD to that specific user, you can, uh, let's say, uh, make that user eligible for application developer and um, uh, application administrator, right? <laughs> and that user, when the time comes and uh, needs to have access on that specific uh, right, um, he or she can ask for elevation in, uh, you can change workflows. So for example, you can modify the workflows in order for when someone needs to elevate uh, um, him or herself to something like that, uh, you can request a further MFA. You can uh, enable and you can inform someone else in the queue, right? So you can do all these kind of things with privileged identity management. And you can do this also not only for um, Azure AD roles, but you can do it also for resource RBAC roles, okay? Which is great and important also. Third one, resources and authorization. Um, talking about, first of all, the, the hierarchy. I would say there are two types of hierarchy here. There's the Azure, and since we are talking about SQL, there's also a SQL hierarchy, right? And if I switch to my whiteboards just for a second to show you a couple of things. Um, so let's switch to the whiteboard. And Let's say, first of all, we have our Azure AD tenant, right? So this is our Azure AD tenant. And below the tenant, we can have, um, we can enable management groups, right? And the first one is called the root management group. And then you can have multiple management groups up to uh, six levels, right? And it's management group. So management group one, management group two, management group three, Etc. Right, and you can have up to uh, six levels of management groups. So this is the nesting, the maximum nesting. You can have up to ten thousand management groups. So management groups are a way to apply things at scale. Right. Imagine having a management group, and then you have, for example, it could be a management group like um, your uh, regions, right, or it could be your companies. And here could be your root company, your enterprise, right? Depending what kind of, uh, let's say, um, governance, architecture, and designs you have prepared. And below them, you have subscriptions, okay? So you have subscription, subscription one, subscription two, right? Etc. Now, this is a, a way, let's say, to how to, um, segregate your uh, workloads also, and also have billing boundaries and also security boundaries, the logic of, uh, let's say, the um, of subscriptions. So below our subscriptions, um, we have our resource groups, right? And at the final, uh, let's say, level, we have our resources, right? So our resources uh, can be uh, VM can be a SQL DB, whatever we can deploy on uh, on Azure, right? Hundreds of services. Uh, so this is our hierarchy, starting from the management group, the root management group. Then we have different kinds of uh, management group levels below subscriptions, of course, and under the subscriptions we have resource groups where we deploy our um, uh, individual resources. So in this. Uh, logic of, uh, let's say, um, of, high, of hierarchy, we can go and apply uh, things like role-based access control for authorization, so permissions on, our, uh, on different kinds of level, either at scale by applying on a management group or at subscription level or at resource group. Stay on the resource group as a lower kind of scope. All these are uh, considered to be scopes, right? So this is a scope, this is a scope, Wherever you can apply any of these kinds of, uh, let's say, uh, RBAC policies or budgets, these are considered scopes, okay? So try to stay on uh, as a low level, as a lower level, try to stay on the resource group, okay? Don't go lower, it will be a mess afterwards to uh, to uh, manage the, the individual resources and uh, assignments, okay? So uh, you have the RBAC, you have policies, initiatives, if you want to apply something at scale for compliance reasons, checking against um, built-in initiatives um, like 
PCI uh, for financial organizations or HIPAA for health organizations or FedRAMP or whatever. There are um, um, dozens of built-in policies and initiatives that you can make use of, or you can even create your own um, uh, policies and initiatives. And also apply things like budget for costing purposes that can roll up to your uh, enterprise level. Okay, so this is the, the hierarchy for uh, Azure. There is also the hierarchy for SQL, right? And this is where uh, we also can, um, let's say, we have the different kinds of uh, permissions that we can apply. So we have our uh, SQL instance level, we have database level, we have schema, and we have object level. So at any kind of this, let's say, um, permissions you can apply, you have also this kind of hierarchy. Try also to uh, do things by separating schema, maybe for, a top, uh, let's say, assigning to specific um, groups of users the equivalent, let's say, uh, security permissions, right? So try to stay away again from the object level and from the individual user. Stay as much as uh, on a more abstract level than the individual one. Okay, so two types of hierarchies. Let's switch back to our deck. And then we have the RBAC roles, and we said that RBAC roles is all about authorization. You see it in Azure everywhere, right? It's about identity access management. This is how you can get very granular uh, by creating either your own custom RBAC roles or by leveraging the uh, built-in uh, roles. There are three uh, roles that govern, let's say, all resources that are everywhere, the owner, the contributor, and the reader. The owner can do everything, contributor can do everything, but not delegate access to others or elevate oneself from contributor to owner. So um, this is the difference between owner and contributor. And there's the reader who can read all the resources that has access based on the scope, either management group or subscription or resource group, uh, but cannot do anything to modify the resource. Now, in case you don't uh, find a good fit of uh, built-in RBAC role, you can create your own custom RBAC role with JSON, right? Take one, customize it, create it, assign your groups of users, and that's it. But try not to overdo it. It's going to be also uh, quite difficult to manage afterwards. But just enough access, remember. So don't overdo it but also don't overgive access because there is no, let's say, exact fit. So balance things, right? Balance. Um, there are product specific RBAC roles are in our case for SQL. There is the SQL security manager. There is a SQL DB contributor or SQL server, server contributor. Different kinds of uh, resources have different kinds of specific RBAC roles. Okay. And then uh, last is the resource logs. Make use of them. Uh, know them, they exist. Um, when something is working, you have a resource group where you have everything uh, up and running. You can enable these uh, resource logs so nobody can delete something. So maybe if an attacker gains access at any kind of level, um, if they don't have the owner um, on the specific, for example, resource group where the lock is applied, they will not be able to remove it or even delete anything. Um, so these are things that you need to do to know in order to make sure that you can uh, follow the rest of the things on how you can apply. So in order to apply best practices, first of all, you need to know the capabilities of something, right? So securing SQL Server can be viewed as a series of steps involving four areas, the platform, uh, the platform authentication, uh, things like the objects, of course, including data, uh, as well as access to the systems through uh, data governance and threat prevention and detection. So different kinds of pillars, let's say, different kinds of areas that you need to, um, to let's say, take care of in order to achieve the most appropriate results for your security practices. Now, authentication and access management, uh, different kinds of uh, SQL, that you uh, choose to deploy. Remember, we have different kinds of Azure SQL. We have um, Azure SQL as infrastructure as a service. So you have your uh, Azure SQL VM, so VM with SQL Server in. You can either create one from the marketplace or uh, lift and shift your own, right? Um, so this SQL Server can have Windows authentication and can also have SQL authentication. So remember the mixed mode. Um, 
Azure SQL Platform as a Service offering cannot, does not support Windows authentication. Uh, there is now in preview the, the logic of applying, um, working with Kerberos on Azure AD, who would think like, we never said that Azure would talk Kerberos. We were also talking like Azure talks SAML, talks OAuth 2, um, WS Fed, but not Kerberos, right? Kerberos was NTLM, LDAP, was all as, uh, Active Directory things, legacy. Now, we saw that there is a need for that, and we are bringing a complete uh, new uh, realm for Kerberos on Azure, and so the first thing that we'll be working with Kerberos is SQL Managed Instance, and if you want, you can leverage that. It is in preview. It's not, I wouldn't say it's for production workload, uh, maybe talking with Microsoft support for that, um, but you will be at some point doing Kerberos also at least for managed instance. Now, Azure AD authentication and SQL authentication, also both of them supported on SQL uh, pass offerings. Uh, and based on what you choose, you will have different kinds of authentication mechanism. Once you authenticate, then it's about authorization, right? So there are two uh, things on authorization. First of all is the, um, let's say the, um, the authentication and the authorization on the Azure uh, layer, where we're talking about the management of the Azure SQL resources, right? Might that be a VM or a platform as a service offering? So depending on the RBAC you have, you have different kinds of permissions, right? So this is uh, management of the SQL resource. We're talking about the management of data, so inside SQL, talking about the engine permissions, then we have uh, SQL roles and permissions, right? So we're talking about then uh, the classic, let's say, if you want um, SQL uh, authorization uh, layer, where you have different kinds of roles and permissions. Remember the built-in permissions, the fixed server roles like sysadmin and uh, DB creator or security admin. If we're talking about Azure SQL DB, equivalent of DB creator is DB manager and of security admin is um, login uh, manager. So we have these different kinds of roles that we can assign to groups of user, most likely, or at least users, uh, that they can uh, interact with the resources we have. And then we have also role level uh, security. And role level security is an application security feature, right? It's, it is very close to the data, everything happens on the data tier, and enables the ability, let's say it gives the ability to leverage the user execution uh, context in order to see and to give access only to specific portions of the data in a table, um, in a database table. So role, uh, uh, role level security, um, let's say um, partitions or let's say hides the uh, horizontal portion of data so that its user can see only their own data and not the other's data. For example, it could be maybe you have a multi-tenant scenario uh, where each tenant should see their own data only, then based on the user context, you can filter, you can create um, like a where predicate where tenant equals something, right? And you get only your own data. Or maybe you're in a, an application that, um, uh, a sales, as we will see also in the demo, a sales uh, rep should see only his or her own data and not the other sales rep data. But a sales manager should see all of them, right? So by enabling um, role level security policies, you can have just that um, without, let's say, um, changing much in your application. It's just about the, the level uh, of uh, the user who has access on your data. Um, so record level, let's say, security. Uh, without having to make significant uh, changes to your application. Once we go away from the authentication and access management, then we have the, uh, the network security pillar. And in that one, we start with VNet injection, talking about SQL management instance. So SQL management instance, it's not outside, it doesn't live outside of your VNet. So it lives inside your VNet, it needs a specialized uh, delegated subnet where SQL managed instance is going to be deployed, depending what kind of, uh, let's say, um, pricing model you have chosen. It may be um, different kinds of resources that you see deployed, right? 
Um, the thing is that all information stays into your VNet. All traffic stays within your VNet. You can enable uh, things like network security groups and all these kind of things uh, afterwards in the subnet. Uh, the other thing that you can have as a capability is private link for SQL DB, right? So you can bring on, you can bring in uh, the, the platform as a service offering of your SQL DB inside your VNet, so traffic stays within your boundaries. And you can also enable firewall rules and NSGs. Now, firewall rules, talking about SQL firewall rules. Two types of uh, firewall rules. You have database firewall rules that you can enable only with the SQL and also server firewall rules, SQL server firewall rules, uh, in order to uh, block access either uh, only allow access by default everything is disabled everything is denied you need to go explicitly and add access maybe based on your ip or based on which vnet you're coming which subnet you're coming so you can just give access to the specific per, uh, to the specific resources right remember just enough access just in time access and all this kind of things so least privilege and uh the least amount of uh of um of permissions. The network security groups, it's about filtering in, out, and uh, deny, allow. So it's like a stateless firewall, if you will. It is a stateless firewall. Um, so you can create your own rules in order to either explicitly allow or deny, um, let's say, access to your resources. The outbound firewall rules is about, let's say, um, um, stopping unauthorized egress of data from your SQL server. Um, so it can only allow uh, a specific, for example, export of data to a specific storage account or to a specific uh, other, other, another specific SQL server. So you can, uh, let's say, stop the and prevent the data exfiltration. The next pillar is data protection. And data protection is mostly about encryption, right? So we have what we call, uh, let's say, three states, three states of our, of our data. And the three states of our data is in transit, at rest, and in use. So in transit is about uh, TLS, so transport security layer. At rest is about transparent data encryption. And in use is always encrypted, okay? Now, starting from the bottom, always encrypted is a client-side encryption uh, technique, right? It is using the, uh, SQL, um, the SQL driver in order to encrypt and decrypt the, um, the data as they are coming in and out from the application and the, and the SQL. Uh, with the advent of SQL Server 2019, where we have what we call secure enclaves, and we can do better uh, let's say we can write better queries, we can have better performance, we can have feature, uh, let's say, uh, richer features when it comes to predicates uh, and uh, specifically the randomized type of encryption when it comes to always encrypted. It is column encryption, right? Uh, the thing about and, um, always encrypted is that the data inside the databases are encrypted, okay? So uh, the data are encrypted, even the most privileged users like sysadmins or whatever you may be, uh, you will always see encrypted uh, um, data, okay? Unless you have access to uh, the certificates in order to decrypt the information. Uh, when it comes to transparent data encryption enabled by default for the last three or four years now, if you have older SQL databases, maybe you can check and see if always encrypted is enabled. If not, uh, check how you can enable it. Uh, in order to secure, let's say, your data at rest. Remember, everything is uh, on Azure is uh, encrypted at rest with uh, storage service encryption. Uh, transparent data encryption is something specific to SQL. So your data files and your log files and your backup files are encrypted in case there is, let's say, a compromise on, your, um, on the data center of Azure, even that um, uh, the layer of TDE will uh, will not allow the, our data, your data to be uh, decrypted, okay? So this is another layer of protection. And TLS is TLS, you know, you can choose um, minimum, let's say, version of TLS from 1 to 1.0 to 1.2, currently supported. Um, so 1.2 is the latest and the greatest, and you should use that one in order to avoid any uh, security problems um, 
that were surfacing up in the previous versions. Now, dynamic data masking is uh, not considered to be encryption, right? So it's obfuscating, it's hiding information. So it has to do uh, protecting uh, sensitive data without changing the application, right? So um, data is masked and unmasked on the fly. You don't have to do anything on the application side. Uh, the thing is that the privileged users, our sysadmins, uh, DB owners, they can check the information, they can check the data, right? So it's only about the client if we want to just hide some information. Okay, imagine a data center, a call center, some agents um, want to verify the other person on the other side, but we don't want to uh, give much more information to the agent, like credit card numbers, or maybe we have just the four or the first two and the last two digits of your uh, credit card, or maybe just part of your email and whatever, right? So this is also um, a, a good mechanism for and for hiding information from the, uh, from the users. Uh, Azure SQL uh, database ledger is about, let's say, um, understanding if your data has been tampered with. So it's about data integrity. And this is, um, let's say, done through uh, the use of uh, cryptography, right? So it uses the logic of blockchain in the back. Um, it, it has the logic of also starting as the, the temporal tables. It's a bit uh, more sophisticated and more, let's say, um, extended in a way. It has different tables, so it has some uh, what we call uh, updatable ledger tables or appendable uh, ledger tables, append append only ledger tables. If we just want to, let's say, um, block the tables from being updating and deleted. Um, so it's quite more elaborate in terms of what it offers. And it's all about, let's say, the integrity of the data that you host. You don't have to have a specific SQL licensing for that. It is like a feature. So you just enable it now if you want also on your SQL, on your Azure SQL. And it provides these historical records of data, the lineage, let's say, of your data. And that can be, let's say, externally verified. Now, data governance uh, is about uh, data classification and Microsoft purview. So data classification is, let's say, a basic way of identifying, uh, let's say, any kind of sensitive data you have in your, uh, in your database. So it scans your database and tries to, based on the column names, identify if there are some information that is considered to be sensitive, either based on GDPR, maybe uh, principles, or uh, any other kind of privacy, um, let's say compliance standards, right? And based on that, um, you can get reports who is accessing this sensitive data and together with uh, auditing, with SQL auditing, you can get great reports, uh, dashboard reports on who is accessing what, uh, let's say, uh, what frequency and all this kind of stuff. So you can prevent and you can also uh, learn what kind of, let's say, um, uh, workloads are running inside your um, your Azure SQL systems. Microsoft Purview. Microsoft Purview is about, uh, let's say, um, enterprise uh, enterprise level um, governance, right? Data governance uh, helps you manage and govern your on premises, also multi cloud uh, in a logic of software as a service, right? So you can create easily, a, let's say, a holistic uh, approach. Um, an up-to-date map of all your data landscape with uh, things like automated data discovery, uh, data classification, and end-to-end -end, uh, data lineage. So Microsoft Preview, uh, a great asset in that aspect. Now, uh, apart from auditing and sending to multiple targets, meaning storage accounts or uh, event hubs or event hub or um, um, log analytics workspace. You can also now audit the Microsoft support operations, which is also great. And if you want, you can send it to another type of uh, storage, maybe storage account or log analytics workspace. So you have this separation. And now, so you can enable this and you can see what Microsoft operations do when you ask for uh, some help, what they do into your SQL environment. 
Uh, last but not least, as a pillar after, after the data governance is a threat and prevention and detection um, area, where mostly we're talking about Microsoft Defender for SQL and the integration with Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Remember, Microsoft Defender for Cloud is our, let's say, way of um, um, having one central point in order where we have a complete end-to-end -end security posture for, your, for our workloads. Might that be in SQL, in uh, Azure only, or Azure and uh, on-prem, or Azure on-prem and multi-cloud, whatever, right? Wherever we can deploy our agents, our ARC enabled servers or whatever, we can get uh, visibility in what's, uh, what's going on. Now for SQL, there are two uh, specific things that you want to enable. The first one is vulnerability assessment, where continuous assessment of your SQL servers and the databases will uh, give you any kind of, uh, let's say, notification alert if something goes wrong and you need to fix based on the best practices. And as well as advanced threat protection, will try and detect any kind of, uh, let's say, uh, anomalies inside your um, your SQL Server deployment. So um, things like uh, queries that mimic SQL injection patterns, right, or things that has to do with um, um, maybe uh, someone trying to gain access with types of brute force attack uh, logic, or maybe even uh, AM a VM. Uh, that is trying to gain access into your uh, Azure SQL with a legit user, but this machine is already well known, for example, to Microsoft Defender for Cloud, that is uh, uh, maybe being taken over by uh, mining um, malware, right? That is known maybe even to, con to talk with the command and control server. So different kinds of things that you can uh, enable on the threat prevention and detection uh, realm in order to, um, let's say, uh, secure your environment also in that aspect. Okay, now that we have all these, uh, and we know the capabilities in uh, of Azure SQL and, uh, features, uh, we can move on to uh, the best practices, right? So I would say uh, best practices First of all, try to centralize an identity, your identity management. So try to have one repository of your users. So uh, use Azure AD as that one, as your, the Azure, uh, as your user repository. Um, and as much as you can, move away from SQL authentication to things like uh, Azure AD authentication, and if you have SQL VM, to Windows, to Windows authentication. Uh, remember that the users that you are come, that you are uh, synchronizing from your on-prem environment uh, all the way to Azure AD, these users are users that can be used as single sign-on users to your Azure SQL environment, right? So you don't have to recreate them; just one user and can be uh, working from any uh, from any uh, Azure resource. Then. Uh, uh, we talked about bringing them on, and then we have RBAC SQL, uh, RBAC roles and SQL roles. RBAC roles, remember, is about managing the, the SQL uh, resource itself, either it might be a pass offering or an infrastructure as a service offering. SQL roles is about the built-in roles that we have into Azure, uh, into Azure SQL environment or SQL server. Uh, built-in roles, if something is not, uh, let's say, a perfect fit, and, but it's a slight difference, then stay with a built-in role. If there is quite a difference, uh, the attack surface could be used for uh, doing things like lateral movements or whatever. Build a custom role and fit it to exact uh, uh, match of your user profile. Then make use of MFA along with conditional access and identity protection. Those are Azure AD Premium, but most likely your organization uh, is already on Azure AD Premium. Um, at least for the users that should have this, uh, let's say, escalation of privileges, make sure that they are covered by um, Azure AD Premium licenses. P2, in order you have also identity protection where the machine learning algorithms, algorithms about signing uh, risk user uh, policies and risk-based policies are taken into consideration. So, make use of MFA with conditional access. Remember, user fatigue. Don't just prompt user for MFA at some at some point. They will just press approve, and they will not be the ones gaining access, right? 
So assign uh, Azure AD groups uh, or SQL roles to groups of users instead of individuals as much as you can in order to avoid, uh, let's say, um, the overhead management uh, afterwards if something changes, right? Because you have to have a clear map of what you need to change afterwards. And if it's on a resource level, on a user level, it's going to be crazy, right? Now, um, remember separation of duties, very critical. So DBA, Dev, Security Admin, they are not all of them DBAs. They're not all of them uh, sysadmins. They're not all of them DB creators or um, uh, login managers in your SQL DB, right? So make sure just enough access. Use PIM, right? So uh, this is uh, also very important. Uh, I have it here, yeah, leverage features like PIM. Uh, we will get to that. So different accounts uh, for different environments, dev test and prod, doesn't make sense to have the same users, right? And now that it came to me, um, when you bring your, uh, your identities from on-prem to the cloud, don't bring your domain admins, right? Please don't do that. Just take the users you need. Domain admins should not be on uh, on your Azure environment, right? If you have, if you want to have global administrators, create them on Azure AD. Make them global administrators. Don't get them up there, okay? Now, uh, try to avoid dynamic SQL execution in order to avoid SQL injection attacks, use, pro use procedures, use parameters, don't concatenate strings, right? And validate user input. These are very valid and uh, quite, uh, no, it's not mainstream, it's been for many years as uh, best practice, okay? Uh, when using Azure SQL VM, utilize the infrastructure as a service agent extension. Uh, in order to uh, have a good visibility on your VM property, on your SQL VM properties without logging in to, into your SQL or using other tools like uh, SSMS or um, uh, Data Studio or whatever. But with a SQL uh, Infrastructure as a Service Agent extension, which comes um, directly if you deploy it from Marketplace, if not, and you're deploying your own or doing lift and shift of your VM, um, it will pick it up and will install a light agent uh, version. You can uh, upgrade it to full if you want, and you get visibility on licensing or update on patch management, backups, um, uh, disk capacities, and all this kind of stuff, right? So great stuff, make use of it. Uh, trying to make your life easier, right? Don't Use the tools, use the tools. Use all the available forms of encryption and obfuscation. So transpired data encryption, uh, trust in transit, and this is double encryption. So remember we have uh, storage service encryption, we have TDE for data logs and backups. And for our VMs, we can go in and enable uh, BitLocker. So an operating system, we can enable BitLocker for Windows or DM crypt for Linux. Right, so you have another layer of uh, encryption. Um, make use of always encrypted. I know it requires application changes, but if you want to make sure that even the most privileged users do not have access to the data, then always encrypted is the way to go. RLS is about row level security, so giving just the specific access to the data. So horizontal partitioning, horizontal, let's say. Uh, filtering of data automatic or uh, filtering of data uh, by applying security policies and then dynamic data masking so it's not encryption it's obfuscation so it goes into that part so that uh, we can hide information from the client on the fly nothing needs to change on the on the application you do it on the fly it's just like uh, a layer uh, um, before the data reaches the, the client inform application Privileged users can see the data, mind you, okay? Now, use Azure Key Vault to store secret certificates, TDE master keys, as well as customer master keys. Remember, TDE works with customer master keys by default. But if you want to enable your own, bring your own keys into the play, then you can use, you can leverage Azure Key Vault in order to store them, right? And you can also store secret certificates and all the other stuff. So, great resource for um, uh, security management of uh, things of this nature, like certificates, passwords, uh, any kind of secrets, or even the managed keys. There are two types of uh, key vaults, two types of SKUs, a standard and the premium one. Um, standard has to do with, uh, let's say, uh, 
software type of uh, encryption keys used. The standard, the premium one is about um, using HSM, so hardware security modules. Higher type of uh, um, security can be achieved in terms of uh, level of compliance if you need higher level of compliance and you can also use them um, completely isolated so you can match it completely not even microsoft will have access for telemetry so um, this is also something to know uh, data classification along with auditing so uh, it gives you a, a very good information in terms of uh, keeping sensitive data in check right and also remember dba should not be the auditor all right, so I think we have been long away from that one, so everything is uh, cool. Now, if you must use password-based authentication, use uh, complex passwords and rotate frequently um, uh, with, Azure, uh, with uh, Active Directory policies for your uh, SQL um, VM, okay? So make sure that you use that. Leverage features like PIM, um, so privilege identity, identity management, uh, is when you want to uh, elevate yourself or some uh, ask for elevation, so you're eligible, eligible for a role, but you don't have it at all times. You have it only when you need it, right? So this is uh, quite important. Just enough access, just in time, right? And remember also Bastion for VM management and just in time VM access uh, in order to um, just connect when you need it based on your own IP, not public IP access uh, on your management port. This is it's a matter of hours before someone gets in, right? Uh, enable Microsoft Defender for SQL in order to leverage the advanced threat protection and the vulnerability assessment of your uh, SQL database and VM and uh, servers. Uh, it also works for VMs, of course, as well as uh, the SQL database. Uh, another thing, uh, IP firewall rules, database firewall rules, remember different kinds of firewall rules we can create, IP uh, firewall rules about the server, database firewall rules about the database, the SQL, okay? And then you have the uh, subnet delegation, remember service endpoints, as well as private links if you want to bring in the platform as a service inside your virtual network traffic, okay? Uh, network security groups, stateless, firewalls, Enable it in order to protect your SQL VMs and SQL managed instance from um, uh, access of unwanted access anyway from uh, different um, uh, uh, origination users anyway and uh, workloads. Uh, last but not least, when you enable a private link, disable access from uh, Azure services to reach your Azure SQL resources. So set it off, disable it, okay? So once you do that, then um, all the traffic will be routed through um, the private link. And with that, we finished the Azure security best practices, okay? And then now we can go in and dive in into demos. Okay, so let's switch to our demo. <clears throat> I'm in my portal, I'm in my tenant here. Um, let's start off with uh, Azure Active Directory and have a uh, quick look on conditional access and how we can force MFA for users who are um, DPAs and who are, uh, who to which we want to enforce MFA through conditional access. So in my case, um, I have a user called a SQL DBA1, uh, who is part of a SQL DBA's group, and I want to enforce conditional access on that one. So I will go to security, part of my Azure AD tenant, then move to conditional access, uh, where I have a MFA for SQL DBA's. I can go in, and you can see that I have uh, checked one group, SQL DBA's, right? So I'm selecting that one, and I have an app to include, which is uh, Azure SQL database. Okay, and that one, and I will grant control, uh, but I will require multi-factor authentication. Okay, so that one is a way to enable and force MFA, if you will, to your uh, SQL DBAs um, when they are trying to uh, get access to uh, an Azure SQL DBA, DB. Okay, now let's go to one of our um, SQL servers and, uh, and have a look on uh, one of these servers. Okay, so I have a resource group um, that has 
different kinds of resources, has a VM, uh, has a disk of the VM, have some uh, logical SQL servers and some SQL database uh, deployed, okay? So let's have a look for, uh, for example, on, uh, on one of these uh, logical servers. So I'm in my, uh, you see here, SQL server, right? So um, I can see the location in Germany was central, and I can also see um, who is the server admin. So we see here the server admin is a SQL user, right? I don't have any Active Directory administrator, so I'm failing to do some of these, uh, let's say, best practices. So let's go and see how we can put these things in order. So first of all, let's go to Azure Active Directory and add an admin. So I will add the admin that I just created, um, that I did, let's say, uh, um, MFA for, DBA, uh, uh, SQL DBA, yeah. Okay, so I select that one. So this one will now be also part of my um, sysadmins, if you will, of my on uh, on that SQL server, right? Now, one of the things I can do here, support only Azure AD authentication on the server, so this will make it even more stricter, even more secure, okay? So if you get to this level, uh, make sure that you go uh, this direction. Now, the other thing that is important is this security um, blade here. We have firewalls and virtual networks. This is where we can go in and change minimum TLS version. We can deny public network access, but remember we said that you do that once you have the private endpoint connection enabled, okay? In terms of connection policy, we have default. There is proxy redirect. Default means for the ones that are coming in from, uh, sorry. So from the ones that are coming in from within Azure, we are using the redirect, which is uh, faster in terms of connectivity, while the ones coming outside of Azure are going to be using the proxy, okay? Um, allow Azure services and resources to access the server. Remember we said uh, no. Uh, so this makes it more, uh, let's say, secure and allows only uh, trusted Azure services to have access like the Microsoft Backup, Microsoft Azure Backup. And this is where the IP firewall is kicking in. So in this case, I have my IP um, access, uh, correctly set up here. I can go and add client IP. So it understands what is my IP and goes in and adds it, right? So I can save it. So I can access afterwards uh, the databases that exist in this uh, SQL uh, server, unless there is a database uh, firewall that doesn't allow me explicitly, okay? Uh, it should be here, let me see. Yeah, okay. Now, if I want to just give access only to specific virtual network, which is the best practice, right? I can do that. So I can go in and add the existing virtual network or create a new virtual network. So I can choose one of my virtual networks that I already have in order to give access to that one only, okay? That will make it much more easier um, for my uh, security and from security perspective to access uh, my SQL DB only from specific uh, virtual network subnets, okay? Outbound networking and restrictions about outbound networking. Remember, we said if you want to allow only your SQL server to, uh, to um, let's say, allow egress of data from your SQL server to specific storage account or to specific other uh, SQL server for exporting information. That way you can, uh, let's say, prevent uh, unauthorized exfiltration of data. So prevent this kind of egress of data. So this is one of the things that you need to uh, check. The other one is, uh, private endpoint. So this is where you're going in and creating a private endpoint in order to access your SQL DB as a, a private IP inside your VNet. You give the name, right? Um, private link, uh, GAP01, GAP2201. Uh, you give the region. Okay, next. Uh, Target sub resource, we want a SQL server so we understand what is the resource uh, that we want to target, what is the virtual network. Uh, pop, 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 pop. Uh, it needs to be in the same region, so this is West Central, German, Germany, 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 West Central. Let's have a look again. Yep. Uh, pop, 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 pop. Uh, no existing, 
in card subscription and location that is uh, strange let's have a look okay so the thing is that my vnet uh, resides on north europe so that's the problem so i changed to uh, north europe and then uh, i continue resource virtual network now it identifies my virtual network and my subnet right if i had multiple subnets i could choose the subnet i want and once I do that, then I can integrate with private zone, uh, DNS zone. Remember, I need that in case I need to communicate with other virtual networks apart from that one. And then I can do next tags and review and create. And it will just create my private link, my private endpoint for linking in with my um, specific Azure SQL uh, uh, server and its DBs. So once I do that and I have created my private endpoint, now I can go in if I want and disable the access to my other virtual network, to my other um, connectivity services. So once this is deployed, um, this will be, you can you can use it to uh, block all other access. Now, Microsoft Defender for Cloud, moving down the, the, um, the things we have in our security blade, you see that uh, Microsoft Defender for SQL is disabled. I can enable it, but you see some recommendations here anyway that are coming from Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Okay, so Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Um, so if I, let's open another uh, window and go to uh, Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Uh, let's click here, Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Yeah, go away now. Uh, Microsoft Defender for Cloud, the old Azure Security Center where we changed back in November um, during the Ignite. Uh, so, one uh, view for all your security posture in Azure, AWS, GCP, whatever you have, right? You can uh, just use what kind of subscriptions you want to check, maybe only this one. And I can only have uh, just security posture on this specific subscription, right? So I can enable different kinds of, uh, um, let's say, um, I can see different kinds of recommendations for my workloads. And in this scenario, you see I have secure score 50. How I can, I have NMFA, uh, which is fine for everything. Apply system update, so I need to apply some uh, agent updates on this one. This is unhealthy, this is completed. Um, so things that I can, actionable things that I can go in and um, to do in order to, uh, to improve my secure score, the higher the better, right? And you can have a history of how things are evolving around your secure score. The good thing about environment settings uh, is that you can enable and see what kind of, let's say, um, things you have enabled for your defender plans. One of them is, um, as you will see, databases here, right? So it's fully configured. You can edit the configuration if you want. Uh, enabled, disabled, and all this kind of stuff, okay? So once we have this, we can go and enable this one. You get different kinds of things, like SQL Server should have an Azure Active Directory administration provisioned. We already done that, so it takes some time for this to work, right? Auditing on SQL should be enabled. Private endpoint should be enabled. Microsoft Defender for SQL should be enabled. So you get all these kind of, uh, let's say, recommendations in order for you um, to enable and start working towards a better, let's say, secure hygiene for your SQL. Let's enable the Microsoft Defender for SQL for our SQL server, uh, for our logical SQL server. So while this is uh, being enabled, uh, we see also the deployment of the resource group of the private link is still in progress, right? So things are happening in the back. Uh, let's move on to transparent data encryption. You see that this is enabled by default. Uh, we have a service management key. If you want to bring your own keys, you can do customer managed key and then go in, pick up the key vault that you want, pick up the key, uh, pick the key you want, and this will uh, just change the way um, uh, transparent, uh, transparent data encryption is, uh, is encrypted using your own keys. Mind you, learn more about this if uh, you already have some workloads on, uh, so you don't get any into any uh, surprises, okay? In terms of auditing, you can enable SQL Server auditing on the server level, and this means that this will be inherited down to all the databases, okay? So if I go to my uh, databases now without changing here anything, you will see that, for example, let's go to this one. 
and if I go to um, security, I have a bit different kinds of things that I see from the security of the server, right? And if I go to um, transparent data encryption, you see it's on, right? And auditing, it's off. I don't have anything. Server level loading is disabled. I can enable it on a database level, but let's go on the server level again, okay? So I go and enable it on the server level. This means it will propagate down. I can send it to one of my storage accounts, right? So with uh, storage access keys or manage the identity. If I choose manage the identity, which is better, uh, always opt to uh, using it to manage the identity instead of other type of credentials. The endpoint, as you see here on the top, was successfully deployed. Um, I can enable this one. So I'm saving now the auditing for my SQL, Azure SQL uh, auditing on the server level. When we change to database, you will see that this has been, uh, let's say, um, inherited. So you cannot change it. Um, also below here, you see the auditing of Microsoft support uh, operations. This is where you can enable also uh, this information. Okay, so you can enable also this in a different storage account or same, it doesn't matter. Okay, so this is something also that you can enable. Uh, so if I go back to my database now, you'll see that um, in the auditing, I should have this uh, inherited. You see, is enabled. Okay, so um, this is also. Uh, Yeah, you see here, if blob auditing is enabled on the server, it will always apply to the database regardless of the database settings, okay? Of course, you can do it also explicitly if you want. You can say it to long analytics or whatever, right? But you don't have to. Uh, let's go back to our SQL server uh, level and let's have a look on uh, the Microsoft Defender for Cloud and see what's going on now. So you see now this is enabled, okay? So it is configured. I, if I want, I can change some things. I can send the email report to someone, so I can send it to myself, right? So um, let's send it to Vasilis at sqltattoo.com, right? So any vulnerability assessments and all these kind of things will come to my uh, mailbox in order to see if I need to do something. So I can save that. So all the information, all reports will be coming to me in order to see uh, that I'm uh, good to go. Uh, so auditing is uh, something that is enabled. The good thing is that you can go and fix things. So whatever you see here are, uh, let's say, um, uh, actionable, right? Uh, so like, for example, this one, take action. So I can disable public network action. Uh, I can uh, disable public network access to my uh, SQL Server and databases. So uh, I have this one, it's approved. As you can see here, it works, right? I can approve, I can reject, whatever, it doesn't matter. I can go in and change if I want afterwards, deny public to network access, and everything will be trafficked uh, through my uh, private endpoint inside my VNet. Okay. Um, now, let's go to the database. Let's go to the database and have a look on uh, how much time we have. We're 15. Um, let's give it like some more minutes. Let's go to our database and let's have a look on uh, that is covering classification. So this will go in and scan our database and then it will say currently using uh, SQL information protection policy, we have found 15 columns of classification recommendations. You can go here, you can see the different kinds of recommendations you get for the schema, the table, the columns, what kind of sensitivity label can be applied like confidential GDPR or plain confidential, right? And you can select all and then accept selected recommendations. And then afterwards, you can start in getting uh, reports on that one. Of course, you can change sensitivity labels. You see here different kinds of sensitivity labels. You can add your own classification. This is also uh, great in terms of classification, right? So you can create your own classification. And then you also have 
information uh, overview. <coughs> it might take some time to populate, uh, but it will get there. Let's save. Yeah, you need to save first. Let's have an overview, and now you see that the um, reports are working as supposed to be. Okay, in the third pipe of configuration, different kinds of labels that you want to create your own labels, right? Remember, when you're doing classification afterwards, you can have your own sensitivity labels. Um, dynamic data masking, I'm going to be using, um, let's say, uh, where is my SQL managed? Yep, it's here. So I have my SQL management studio, right? Let's uh, put this one down. And I have connected already to my SQL server, right? And what I will do is I will uh, do a couple of demos. First one is about um, dynamic data masking, okay? So I'm connected to my uh, SQL database. What I'm going to do, I'm going to create a schema it's called data. I'm going to put a table in there. I'm going to insert some data into this table, and then I'm going to select to see what happens. Okay, so I should have four rows here in the membership. I can see them. You can see that there are clear text, right? So I can see all this information as I'm connected with uh, my user. Now, what I will do is I will create a user without login. This is like the application role we used to have in the past. This is easier to manage than application roles. Um, so I'm going to use that. I'm going to grant select on that user. And then I'm going to impersonate that user. So I can execute as if that user was executing the select. Okay. I'm going to do again the select. And this time you see I get masked. Okay. So I don't get all the information. I get some information. Okay. Uh, if, I if I run revert, it just reverts the context. And if I run again, I run on my own context, so I get all the information. This you see here, we have some masking um, going on, right? So masked with, masked with, so different kinds of function masking my results. Since that user, marketing uh, masking test user, doesn't have the unmask uh, pr permission, uh, he or she cannot do that, right? Only I can do that. Now, this is was about dynamic data masking obfuscation. Let's go to um, RLS, so role level um, security. What I will do, I will create two users again without login, right? So I can impersonate them. I will create a sales schema and I will create the tables orders and then I will insert some information there, six rows, okay? Okay, let's run this and check the sales order. I have my six rows, and what you see here is I have a sales rep, uh, three rows for sales rep one, and three rows for sales rep two. Now, I grant select on this uh, table to the three users I've just created before, right? And what I will do, I will create a schema called security. And this is as a best practice when you're talking about RLS and implementing RLS, it's better if you create a security schema or a different schema in a way where you put all your RLS related resources. I will create an inline function table value, uh, inline table value function TVF, in order to check the user execution context every time um, they are check, they're running a query, right? So I will execute it creates this function. It's called like that, and it passes the sale rep from the context of the user that is running the query every time, and if it's the username uh, that is being passed, right, or if the username is manager. And then I grant permissions on that uh, table level function. Okay, so what I will do now, I will create the security policy. This is where I create the, uh, the RLS policy, the role level uh, security policy, okay? It's called sales filter, and I add filter predicate security, uh, the one, the table value function I've created above, okay? On the specific sales order table with state on. So once I do that, then I will go and execute a sales rep one, okay? Now you see, I see only my uh, data. If I execute a sales rep two, I see only sales rep two data, right? I don't see 
sorry, I don't see sales rep one data. If I execute as manager, again, I see all the data. Now, if I go and disable, so I put state off on my security policy, so I disable RLS on that specific uh, policy. If I again run as the other users, you see I get all the table, all the data for all the users, right? So this is RLS um, uh, demo. Um, yeah, one of the things that uh, is also important is connecting with managed identity. Uh, managed identity is a way, it's a feature, let's say, of Azure AD, and is a way to connect uh, Azure resources together, make them talk together without sharing credentials. So as a best practice, um, we should not save credentials in either inside hard code in our application or in any configuration files or things like that. So it's better if we share them, for example, uh, through a key vault, right? Where uh, we can give access, role-based access control to specific uh, principles. Now, one of these principles could be a VM. So we have managed identities, we have system managed identities and user uh, managed identities. Uh, system assigned managed identities is the one uh, that are tied to a specific resource. The user uh, assigned um, uh, managed identities, it's a one that uh, it's not tied to a specific resource uh, lifecycle. So you can assign it to multiple, let's say, Azure resources. Take, for instance, uh, VM scale set. Now, in our case, what we have done, we have uh, went into our uh, VM. Let's go to our VM and have a look on what, how it looks like. So this is our VM. And I have went in here, identity, and I have enabled my uh, system assigned identity on the specific VM, okay? Once I do that, I need to go into my, um, sorry. I need to go on to my Azure SQL and uh, grant access to that specific principle and also give some kind of permission role, uh, SQL role permission on that specific principle in order to gain access. Okay, so let's do that first. Uh, so let's connect onto our server. We are connected already. I'm going to open my, um, my script. It must be here. Uh, it's in another screen sorry for that okay so what I will do is take these two uh, lines right I'm going to open a new query and what I'm doing is I'm um, creating a user that is the name of the VM right so that's the name of the VM from external provider so this is Azure AD so I'm executing this one uh, oh yeah so Correct. So first I have to create with Azure Active Directory. So let's go back one step and um, connect to, to this server with my Active Directory user. So uh, I will be uh, SQL DBA1 at learning.net. I should be prompted for the MFA, but because I have connected before, it uh, recognizes me. So this is my uh, uh, database again. Let's open a new query and paste it again and try to do that now. It should work, correct. And now what I do is I grant DB Data Reader on this specific uh, user I created just above. Okay, now this user now is part of my users, right? And I also have access as a data reader. Okay, so this is the user I could just create it with data user. Okay, great. Now what I want to do is I want to mimic that as if that, uh, let's say VM was going to get some information from uh, Azure SQL DB without passing any credentials, right? So what I will do is I will go to my VM. This is my VM. Um, you can see here on the top, it's GAB 2022 SQL VM, right? And I will open PowerShell. And I will initiate the process as if the application was running and trying to get access to um, uh, to my Azure SQL. So I will uh, bring in the script. Okay. So what the script does? Um, so it's going to invoke a web request. This is a loopback address 
on that machine where the managed identity, um, let's say, um, um, the managed identity service is running, and what it will do, it will go uh, to Azure AD, to my Azure AD, and it will request a token, okay, based on the managed the system, managed identity assigned on the VM. Once it does that, it will take the content, convert it from JSON, and it will assign the access token into um, a variable that I will use afterwards in order to connect to my SQL server, okay? So let's try that. First of all, execute this, and let's see afterwards what the access token has inside. It should be uh, the token that I will use afterwards to, um, uh, pop, pop, pop. let's do it like that. So you see, I have the, the access token information from uh, the Azure AD, okay? So I will use that afterwards to authenticate. So you see my connection string here, data source, uh, let's see, we have to change our connection string. So let's connect to that server. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's go to my SQL server. Um, this is the server I want to connect. So let's copy this one. Uh, let's go here and replace that one. And also the database. So let's go to my database. This is a database I've just connected and added the user, right? And I'm also putting the database here. Okay, so once I do that, I have my connection string. You see there is no credential here, no username, password, nothing. I just passed the access token I've just created before. I just took it uh, from Azure AD and I try to open the connection. So let's try this one. Okay, so the connection is now open. I don't have any error, it works, right? What I will do afterwards is I will create a new um, uh, data, uh, an SQL command where I will run just a select query to see if it works, right? So I run this one and I get six. So I got how many rows I have into sales order. And if I run the data set dot tables dot zero, it's a zero based uh, array. And I run that one, I will get the information from the table. So I connected from my VM to my Azure SQL DB, right? So to my platform as a service offering without passing any credentials using identity, uh, managed identity and access token from Azure AD. So this is the proper way, let's say, of Azure resources to communicating with each other without passing credentials or hard coding credentials into our, um, uh, into our code. Okay, and with that, uh, let's switch back to our deck in order to close. So, uh, summary, design security early in the stages of a project and according to zero trust principles. Um, be aware all the security features and capabilities of Azure SQL at all times, new features are coming in uh, uh, very, very fast. So check the Azure feed for any new things around Azure SQL. Use the list privilege principle when you're assigning RBAC and SQL permission. So don't give more than needed. And if someone requests more, ask for justification. So use appropriate authentication mechanism. Remember, try for Azure AD. If you need to have VMs, uh, SQL on VMs, go for Windows uh, authentication instead of SQL authentication, where you can have more elaborate uh, Active Directory policies governing things. Only allow connections from trusted networks. Try to keep things private using uh, private links or service endpoints, network security groups, and all this kind of stuff that you get. Data encryption at all um, states in transit, addressed, uh, in use whenever possible, obfuscation things uh, that you can use. Make use of Defender for Cloud. Remember, ongoing uh, vulnerability assessment, best practices on your workloads, and all this great stuff that you can um, get out of the box. Small fee for, um, let's say, um, a great set of, uh, of tools. Monitor monitoring and auditing is your friend, uh, so don't be afraid to use it. Uh, you have nothing to fear if you are uh, abiding to best practices, okay? Last thing, uh, you can, these are some references that I have used also. Uh, you can scan the QR code and you will get uh, redirected to this uh, link that I have created for you, where there's a document with all the information. 
Thank you very much again for staying with me. Hope you got a great, uh, you got a, uh, hope you like the session and I hope you uh, have a great Global Azure Bootcamp uh, 2022. Take care.